Now, there are certain things that you must come to be acquainted with if you are dealing with uh, the two forms of argument, inductive and deductive. And in the beginning, we would uh, focus on these terms or concepts that are very important if you are dealing with the idea of a deductive argument. The first thing that we have to understand is we have seen that in the deductive argument form, there is a particular form or a formula that we take into account. And it's something like this. Like an example, all men are mortal, I am a man, therefore I am mortal. Now, there is a form over here. Now I can replace this terminologies with a variable, okay, to get the form out of this argument. So wherever I see the term men or any term that deals with the concept or the class of men, I will label with one variable. So all men I say M, okay, are mortal, let us say P, okay. Then I get I, this is a distinct term, so I say S, am a man, M, okay, I, S, mortal, P. So the form is MP, SM, SP. This is the form. That means this is the formula. To give you an example to understand this, take for example these additions. 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, yeah? 3 plus 3 is equal to 6. Now what I can do from this is I can substitute with this these constants with a variable, say x plus y is equal to z. Now this is what is common to all of these additional sums. In other words, all deductive arguments will have this form of mp, sm, sp. Is this clear? Now, what happens if you have an argument which claims to be deductive, which claims to be a deductive argument, but on deriving its form, you see that it does not have this structure. That is, you are given an argument, okay, and then you start deriving its form by replacing all the constants with variables. And you come to realize that this is not the form that it has. In that case, we say that the form of this deductive argument is invalid. Now these are technical terms used very specifically, so you have to take this into account. So an argument is invalid if it does not have the form, the correct form. Okay? So in other words, if, if I have uh, an argument which, is, which has contents, I reduce the, co the content part with a variable, and then I see if the form I derive by replacing the constant with the variable okay, is in fact in accordance with a valid form. If it is not, the form becomes invalid. Now please keep one thing in mind. If you see when we are checking whether an argument is valid or not, you are totally ignoring the content part. So you are not at all bothered with the content. What are you doing here? You are saying whatever is the content, I don't care. I am just interested in replacing this constants that is your content. For example, the content here is men, mortality, I, mortality, man, and I, and mortality. So, but I am replacing all this I, mortality, men with variables. Okay? So I am in fact not at all concerned with the content of the argument. I am only concerned with the form of the argument. And when you are concerned with the form, and if your form is a correct form, then this correct form is called a valid form. So you have a valid argument, and you have an invalid argument. But please keep one thing in mind. When we are talking about a valid argument form and an invalid argument form, we are not talking about the content part. We are just saying 
that this argument is structured in a way which conforms to a valid structure. Okay? Which conforms to a valid structure. Or we are saying that here is an argument whose structure does not conform to a valid structure. If it does not conform to a valid structure, we say the argument is invalid. And if it conforms, we say that it is valid. Now, if, 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 if this is clear to you, then it will also be clear to you that just by looking at the form, you cannot say whether a particular statement is true or false. Because whether to know something is true or false, you will have to know the content. Right? Just for example, if I tell you x plus y is equal to z, okay, this is the form, so this is a valid form. To say or to reach to a conclusion whether it is true or false, you will have to substitute these variables with constants. So x plus y is equal to z. So supposing I substitute this variable over here with a constant, say, 2, this variable over here with a constant, say, 3, then if I say 6, now you can legitimately say that this is false. If I say it's 5, you can legitimately say it's right or it's true. So the question of truth comes into question only once the form is filled with the content. Else, we can only talk of validity. Okay? So this, this distinction is very important. Why? Because you can have a valid form, as you can see there, with false conclusion. For example, I can just write, all men are spiders. Okay? I am a man, therefore I am a spider. Now if you look at it, okay, then you will see that the form is a valid form. The argument has a valid form. But if you look at the content part, then the conclusion is false. Why? Because the premises are false. Right? So that means when I am evaluating an argument, I must consider both the form as well as the content. I must examine both the form as well as the content. If I just examine the form, I will only know whether the argument is valid or invalid. Okay? And if I only examine the content, what will happen? The propositions taken in themselves may be true, but the form, the structure may be invalid. So for an argument to be sound, and this is what all of us should attempt to get, a sound argument. A sound argument is an argument where your form is valid and your content part is also true. So when you have true premises and a valid argument form, you will get a conclusion that is true. Is this clear? The next question now is, so how many forms do we have? How many forms of arguments do we have? Now over here, fortunately, we do not have infinite number of uh, argument, valid argument forms. Okay. Now I'll just give to you some standard forms, some valid forms which you must keep in mind because you constantly use this form. I have told you that you have been doing practice, but the theory that we are making explicit has always been implicit with all of us. Okay. Now I'm making one form explicit. This form is P, then Q. Okay, now please keep in mind, don't get confused. The P and Q are variables which you can substitute with any constant. Okay? If P then Q, P therefore Q. If I hit solids, they will expand. I am heating this solid, therefore it will expand. If P then Q, P therefore Q. This is a valid argument form. I am not saying that if you substitute anything here, you will get a sound argument. I am only telling you that this form is a valid form. So if you have an argument which is structured in this form, your form is valid. Okay? To the content part, we will come in some time. 
The other one is, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. In logic, we have for not a small sign, a curl. Okay, So wherever I use the term curl, please take it to denote not. Now, example, if it rains, okay, then the ground will be wet. The ground is not wet, therefore it has not rained. Valid argument form. If this fellow had taken this medicine, then this would not have happened. Okay, or this would have happened. This has not happened, therefore this fellow has not taken medicine. Had this fellow taken poison, he would have had these symptoms. He does not have those symptoms, therefore he has not taken poison. You, we will see that there are a lot of problems with these. But the form is something that we will use, these forms. Now there are other forms, but uh, in, in basics you will be dealing with uh, these two forms of arguments. Okay. Now please keep in mind, I am repeating again. Just because your argument confirms with this form, it does not mean that your argument is sound. We will have to check the premises uh, as well, the content part. Okay. Now to check the content part is what we have called something called informal fallacies. Fallacies, something is wrong with the argument. So there are two things. You can have a formal fallacy or an informal fallacy. A formal fallacy is a place where your argument has gone wrong because your form has gone wrong. So that becomes a formal fallacy. A fallacy because of the form. Okay? Now for example over here, if, it's, if P then Q, Q therefore P, then your argument is formally fallacious. It is wrong in the form itself. Forget the content. You need not even go to the content. The form itself is wrong. If I say, for example, if it rains, then the ground will be wet. Okay? It has rained, therefore the ground is wet. Now this is fine. Now if instead of this I use an invalid form and say, if it rains, then the ground is wet. Okay? Now supposing I place Q here. The ground is wet, therefore it has rained. No, it has not rained. Somebody took a bucket of water and just splashed it. The ground will still be wet. Right? So, if you are mistaken in the form itself, you have committed a formal fallacy. But you can have a correct form, but the content may go wrong. The content part may go wrong. And if the content part goes wrong, that is when we say that though the argument is valid, but it is wrong because you have committed an informal fallacy. That is. There is an error as far as the content of your argument goes. At the present uh, day, you have more than 120 informal fallacies. So if I start listing all the 120 informal fallacies, we'll be sitting here for the next 10 weeks just doing fallacies. So I'll, I've just picked out the major informal fallacies. Okay. Now, uh, one of uh, the... Uh, now, b before we get into informal fallacies, if you avoid these informal fallacies, it still does not mean that your argument is sound because you may be committing some other informal fallacies. Right? Because there are a lot of informal fallacies. But what it would mean that if you have committed this fallacy, that means your argument is definitely wrong. So it's more of a negative test. It's just like this. It does not imply if you are a graduate, you'll get a job. But if you are not, not a graduate, you will definitely not get a job. So it's something like this. So if you have committed these fallacies in your arguments, then it simply means that it's wrong. If you have not committed it, it however does not mean that you are right. You may still be wrong. There may be other fallacies that you have committed. Right? So because I'm just giving you a, a finite number of uh, these fallacies. Okay. The first fallacy that we do is attacking the source of the argument rather than the argument itself. When you attack the source of the argument okay, or the person or the institution 
rather than the argument itself. For example, if you say, who said that? Mr. Jung said it. Oh, that fellow always lies here. This must be wrong. Now here you are not attacking the argument. You see, you are attacking the person. Okay? No, no, he is an American. Definitely he has self-interest. So this argument is not even worth considering. Again, you are attacking the source of the argument. The argument in itself, you are not bothered with it. You are bothered with the source. This is an informal fallacy. If you want to have a sound argument, you cannot be attacking the source. You will have to attack the argument. Right? Now, in some cases, the source may be a premise in the argument. In that case, you are legitimately attacking. Because then, you are attacking the premises of that argument. You are not attacking the source. Right? So, this is one thing that you have to keep in mind. Another very interesting thing is when you appeal to ignorance. Informal fallacy. That is, just because it has not been proved, therefore, you take the otherwise to be true. Now, one of the most beautiful examples which all of us, you know, partake in is this. God does not exist. How do you know? Prove it. Prove if God exists. Now, the other fellow can't prove God exists. Therefore, God does not exist. Just because somebody else cannot prove P does not imply, therefore, that not P is true. So, just because you are ignorant, it does not imply that your ignorance should not lead to not P being true. So God exists, okay, and you are claiming God does not exist. How are you claiming this? You are telling, prove that God exists. Now this fellow can't prove that God exists, so you are saying, you see, therefore God does not exist. Now this is again an informal fallacy. This does not prove, what is and see, why this is very important? Because when you are attacking arguments, or when you are evaluating arguments, you have to take care of these. You cannot say that your conclusion is right because the conclusion of the other fellow, which is the opposite of a conclusion, cannot prove his conclusion. So an inconclusiveness on the part of an argument does not mean that the other way around is true. So this is an informal fallacy which you all have to take care of. The other one is trying to apply a general rule to a case where it does not apply. A person is going to war. So you tell that person it is immoral to kill, so don't kill. Now, we have a general rule that killing is wrong. Right? But in case of war, this fellow who is going to the front, now will you apply it to him? Does it apply to him? So you have to take care of exceptional cases. So just because you have a general rule does not mean that we can blindly apply it everywhere and anywhere. We'll have to also take into consideration whether this case that you are considering falls under the exceptional category, whether it is an exception. Right? So, this is another informal fallacy which uh, we can sort of uh, uh, consider. The other one that I think is very important, and as uh, medical uh, professionals you must be knowing, is when you have arguments with lay people, lay people like us. Right? So, Basically, we don't know much of medicine. And when we put what medicine does in our terms, what we do, we oversimplify what it does. You know, we do not understand the complexities involved, and we oversimplify the, what the other does, or the, we oversimplify the argument to such an extreme that that oversimplification is not a genuine picture of what is actually happening. Now, this oversimplification is a fallacy. And usually it is called by the common name of the straw man fallacy. You take a man, and then you make a man, okay, an image of him with the help of straw. Now, the straw is definitely ten times weaker than the man. So, it's very easy for you to demolish it. In other words, you simplify the argument of the opponent to such an extent that it is obviously false. That it is obviously false. So, oversimplification of an argument is also a fallacy that we must take care of. Now, please keep in mind, all of these pertain to the content, the content part, not the form. The other one is what we are all very good at doing, namely, 
hasty generalizations making a hasty generalization okay for example cafe coffee day i i had a coffee in coffee day and i found that the coffee was too bad so you generalize coffee in coffee day is bad now this is a hasty generalization namely you are basing an inductive argument but on how many premises a single premise so an inductive argument with very few numbers of premises will lead to this fallacy of uh, uh, you know uh, a hasty generalization where you derive all from very limited number of instances so in other words in in in, in to make it relevant to you all in medicine how many tests do you do before you know that this medicine is fine two is too fine you have two instances you take take two instances and two instances work is that fine for you to now generalize and say all cases will be fine so this is a hasty generalization so we have to take into consideration that the generalization that we are reaching or the conclusion of the argument is not based on an hasty generalization approach right there are other forms of arguments for example one which i think i think most of the academicians in india are prone to namely appeal to authority it was published in us journal what does that mean it means nothing it was published in a us journal therefore it must be true does not imply no no it was published in a journal in uh, you know somewhere in the remote areas of north india can't consider that appeal to authority now appeal to authority sometimes can be right for example appeal to icmr for ethical guidelines but sometimes appeal to authority may not be really the thing that you your argument is looking for to be proved you may appeal to inappropriate authorities okay now if you take advertisement very literally then you will see that this fallacy is involved in all advertisements now sevag is telling you that reliance mobile is the best now who is he to tell what does he know about mobile technology nothing so this is an appeal and supposing you are now this sevag saying it is not a fallacy but a friend is now telling you you ought to buy reliance why sevag says so now this is appeal to inappropriate authority now the catch over here is you have to decide which authority is legitimate and proper right which authority is legitimate and proper so this is the catch here but you must consider that not all appeal to authority brings out arguments which are conclusive so just because it's published in a us journal does not make the argument or your premise true or the argument a sound argument other one is which which is uh, which comes up most of the time uh, when you are talking about informed consent is the idea of appeal to force when instead of making a person agree on the basis of the argument you make the conclusion or you try to make the conclusion true by an inappropriate use of force now force does not merely mean physical it can also be economical you say that i'll give you 300 dollars if you do this or i'll give you this if you do this or if you don't do it i'll kill your wife now all these examples are examples we are trying a person to accept a conclusion but not on the basis of the argument you are doing that on the basis of a force the other one which i think is very important in at least as far as morality goes and at least in india is this argument of fallacy rather of appeal to the popular mass everybody does it it must be true why because everybody does it just because everybody does it does not make a thing true everybody believed once upon a time that the earth was flat did not make the earth flat the earth was still round so an appeal to popular mass or the thing that everybody does it does not justify an a, a premise or a statement to be true now there is one particular fallacy that uh, i i want to stress upon namely the fallacy of ambiguity and this is a fallacy which science has to be really careful about and social science has to be more careful about 
because we have terms here which can mean more than one thing. Now, if you are using a term in one sense of the term in one premise, using it in another sense of the term in another premise, in another sense of the term in your third premise and therefore deriving a conclusion, your argument is wrong. Though it may have the same validity, you know, in terms of the form, you may say man, 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 like bank, bank. All banks are beside the river. State bank is a bank. Therefore, state bank is beside a river. Okay? Now here, the form, if you look at the form and just substitute the variables with, uh, the constants with the variable, you'll get a legitimate form. Right? But if you look at how you're getting that form, you'll see that the term means something different. One is a river bank, the other is a money bank. Right? So these kind of terms, now, you, you must be knowing, uh, you, you must be feeling what I mean when I say that terms can be really ambiguous. And one of these terms is what we are dealing with. It's good. It's ethical. What does this actually mean? We all assume that it means something, but what does it mean? Does it mean the same thing when I use it and you are understanding it? So this sort of ambiguity is very important to be taken care of when you're dealing with an argument. Now with this, I come to one fallacy which I think is of prime importance, mistaking the whole for the totality of the parts. If you mistake the whole to be a totality of its parts, this is a fallacy. Now to give you a, a, an example, if you are studying how water behaves, okay, you are, you are, you are, a, you are, you are a chemistry student, and you want to understand the nature of water, how water actually behaves, this compound actually behaves. Now you break it into its constituent parts and you know that water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen, right? So you have, okay, so we have this, that hydrogen plus oxygen will give you water. Now you want to understand the characteristics of water. Now to do this, what do you do? If you study hydrogen and you study oxygen, and combine the knowledge of these two and think that now you know the nature of water, you are involved in a fallacy. You are mistaking the parts for the whole. The whole may have a totally distinct nature altogether. Right? And this is a very important fallacy when you are dealing with research pertaining to the society. Because if you take for granted that the totality of individuals is the society, then you may land up in this fallacy. Because the nature of the society as such may be different from the nature of individuals. This usually happens. When we are only individuals and we are, in, we are confronted by individuals, we tend to be honest. But so, if, you, if you extend this all together to the society, so therefore the society is honest, may be a fallacy of this. When you are mistaking the whole for the parts. Right? So these are certain informal fallacies that we must take care of when we are uh, you know, facing an argument and trying to evaluate the worth of that argument. And now we come to this part. And this is where my focus for today's lecture would be. Namely, though in all domains of knowledge we use this form, if P then Q, if P then Q. But as far as it is formal, it, it's fine. Once you fill it with content, then it becomes problematic because now you would have to distinguish between the various kinds of if-then. Now, for one example, an if-then, if P then Q, could be a causal if-then. That is an empirical cause. It can be a law of nature, something that you discover. If it is a body and allowed to fall free, it will fall to the center of the earth, if then. But this if then is causal or empirical in nature. This is a law of nature which we discover. So this is one if then. Now you can have Conventional if then.
if you meet your elders then you are to touch their feet for blessing this is a conventional if then it's not a law of nature and you do not discover it it is constructed so this is a construct so if then can be empirical it can be a law of nature which is discovered if then can be conventional or something which is constructed okay it could be definitional that is based on definition for example all bachelors are unmarried men all bachelors are unmarried men this is based on the definition of a bachelor right therefore if x then q if p then q but it is not causal it is not conventional it is definitional right now there is a slight problem between these two if we can really distinguish between conventional and definitional because definition is another form of con convention now the problem why i am making this distinction is because mathematicians will not be very happy if you say mathematical truths are true but you say that mathemat is for example see if 2 plus 3 is added you will get 5 if 2 plus 3 then 5 So it's an if then, but if you tell a mathematician it's based on convention, then he will doubt. He will say, "No, no, it's not convention, man. Convention is too much. You are diluting mathematics." You can say it's definitional. By definition, it's true. Right? So that's why we have to make this definition, uh, this distinction between convention and definition. Then you have logical, logical if then. okay if something is then something cannot be not is that is if i am then it cannot be i am not because it is either i am or i am not i cannot be both i am and i am not right until and unless you are a poet and talking metaphorically i was here but i was not there so this is metaphorically we say in poetic language you see is yes or no that i was sitting right beside you you were present but then you were absent but this is only metaphorically speaking if you speak it literally that you were there but you were not there this is a contradiction right a thing can be or not be so these are logical truths now let me again clarify that some truths in mathematics some mathematicians will claim are neither conventional nor definitional they are logical so there are logical truths definitional truths conventional truths now one thing is there Conven conventional truths are constructs definitions are also constructs that is why you can see in euclid you can change one definition and get another geometry right now you have logical if then which again is necessary and this is not constructed this is also discovered now why i am stressing so much on this is the fact that when science deals and since we all are devotees of physics because we tend to up, look up at physics as the science we tend to think that all if then are of this nature which is wrong all if then are not of this nature the if then that you deal with most is neither of these it is a decisional if then that is if i am sick then i'll go to the doctor but then i need not go also this is the decision you can't say 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 but it can't be 5 also i can decide on that you can't you can't say if i let this object fall freely then i can decide whether it will fall or it should not fall so the truths that most of the time that we deal with are if then of the decisional nature okay however if you make it decisional then what is this decision based on now 
The problem with ethics is this, that if you are talking about an ethical truth, this ethical truth cannot be arbitrary. It has to be necessary and it has to hold for every rational being as we have seen. So it can't be arbitrary. Therefore, it cannot be a construct. Because if it is a construct, then it becomes arbitrary. So, ethical truths cannot be conventional, one. Two, it cannot be true on the basis of definition. Because if it is true on the basis of definition, I can change the definition. Again, it becomes arbitrary. So, ethical truths no longer becomes necessarily true. In other words, they do not become absolute. They can change pertaining to person to person as per definition. So it becomes arbitrary. Now ethical truths as we have seen cannot be arbitrary. Okay? But they, they have to be absolute in the sense that it must appeal to all rational beings. Therefore it cannot be a construct in the sense of a convention. It cannot be a construct in the sense of a definition. Now please keep one thing in mind. When we are saying this, we have to yet consider that we are still speaking before the 20th century. That is, we are still in the domain of thinking that ethical theories are cases of I know. In the 20th century onwards, you will see that there has been a shift. People have thought that no, 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 it's one of these two, can't be the other. But for the time being, since we are looking into the theory of ethics on a traditional basis, you will have to understand that theories of ethics okay, or ethical truths cannot be arbitrary, they have to be absolute. Therefore, it cannot be a true if then on the basis of convention, it cannot be an if then on the basis of definition, because both of them are construct. Now you have two options left, and it cannot be decisional as well, because if it is decisional, then again it becomes arbitrary. You can decide whether stealing is good or bad, you can decide, because it's your decision, right? So now philosophers or theorists dealing with ethics have two options open to them, either they say, it's something of this nature, a law of nature sort of thing which you discover, or they say that it is a logical truth of this nature that it is also discovered. But it is not empirical. Here, it is not empirical. Here, it's empirical. Now, people who believe in this, later on in the next lecture you will see, are people who build up utilitarian theories. Utilitarianism as a theory of ethics is based on this idea that the if then is causal is like a law of nature which you discover through empirical means. And what is right and what is wrong is decided on the basis of empirical means. Now this is based on the understanding or taking physics to be the science. So everything is empirical, has to be empirical, has to be based on empirical evidence. So causal, if then is only causal for them. They ignore everything else. The other option is to take like Kant did, as you will be seeing again in, in, in the coming session, to say that it is not empirical, but nevertheless, since it has to be necessary and absolute, it cannot be arbitrary. So instead of taking this option, Kant takes this option, that it is logical. So deontological theories, on the other hand, are based on the idea that the if-then is logical. So it is not an empirical causal truth. It is a logical truth. Therefore, it is necessary. But you will see that what is common to both of these ethical theories is they evade being convention or definition based theories because that would make them arbitrary. And nobody wants an ethical theory that is arbitrary because if it's arbitrary then as you know the famous saying anything goes. And it is just because of this reason that you don't want anything to go you want theories in ethics. If anything will go is fine with us then there is no need to discuss when we need not have this discussion at all. Why are we having this? Why do we want to know what is ethical, what is to be done? Because we know that anything does not go. It should not go. Right? So, with this, uh, I just come to the concluding session of this uh, fallacies, arguments, by making you aware of two things. One, on the board, this looks very easy. Finding out deductive, inductive, oh, form is very easy, just substitute, as I simply said. But this is not a fallacy, I'm not oversimplifying it. <laughs> yeah? But it's not an oversimplification. As I told you, I did not want to oversimplify it. But in real life, 
when you get instances, when you're basing your decisions, when you're looking at arguments, it's not such an easy task. And for example, the argument is this. Now this medicine vaccine trial is very risky, okay? Now the issue is whether you can have human subjects or not. And the argument that this gentleman is giving is this. That of course it's fine because after all human beings get, and he's paying people to become, you know, the guinea pigs. He's paying the people to become guinea pigs, to take that risk. Okay, to take the risk. And his argument goes like this. It's, so he has a press conference and people say, no, is this not unethical? Is this not, is this acceptable? And he says, of course it's acceptable. Why? Because the argument goes that we pay people to take risk and that is acceptable. Therefore, in this case also, it is acceptable to pay someone to take the risk. Now, what he means by that, that is all he argues here. But the hidden assumption is this, that a miner takes a risk. A person who works in a coal mine takes a risk. You are paying him to take that risk. Right? So you pay a miner to take the risk and it is acceptable. A construction worker who builds a house hanging on those bamboo slits, you pay him to take that risk and it's acceptable. Right? Now crossing the road is also another problem. Meaning <laughs> that is also a risky business which is also acceptable. There we don't get paid. But he is therefore arguing that if I give money to this human subject to take a risk, it should also be acceptable. What's wrong with it? Now you will see that he here is arguing in an inductive way. This is not a deductive argument, first of all. Because he is basing case upon case, case upon case. He is saying, we pay a minor to take the risk, right, and it is acceptable. We pay Mr. X to take certain risk as a construction worker, that is acceptable. Therefore, it is acceptable to pay someone to take a risk. Now the problem is here, he is avoiding that small patch. He is generalized and this generalization is a hasty generalization based and what are you fooling around with here? That's why I paid a lot of stress there. You are fooling around with the term risk. This term risk is very ambiguous now. What do you mean by risk? Does, is risk something that you are already aware of? Are you voluntarily willing to take that risk? So all these issues is covered up with this blanket term risk and it is acceptable. The domain of what you are dealing with, namely in medical science, with human subjects is not physics. Because physics merely deals with the first kind of things. If then, which is purely empirical and causal. But you on the other hand, are trying to make it that, but you are dealing with the fifth one. That is your if then most of the time is decisional, not causal. And this you have to take into consideration because if you avoid this, then you land into treating physics and medicine at par. Now, which one is above and which one is lower, I don't want to argue about it. Okay? But one thing is for certain, that the level of complexities involved when you're dealing with physics is distinct and different from the level of complexity that you're dealing when you're dealing with human beings. What's the reason? The reason is because our arguments, though they are if-then, are not based on merely causal empirical laws. They are based on other, all other kinds of laws. So you come across conventional laws, you come, come across definitional laws, you come across logical laws, you come across decisional laws, and all of them have the if-then form. So we have to take into consideration that when you're dealing with arguments in medical ethics, you cannot be treating the if-then as if it is purely empirical. Right? So with this, I end uh, my lecture.